So good afternoon, dear colleagues. As uh, some, I, some of you know, I am the permanent representative of Chile. I just arrived actually a week ago to Geneva. So let me tell you that this is one of my first uh, events here. So um, um, this is, um, I'm particularly pleased and honored that uh, I'm starting my term here as ambassador with this event. So I, I would like to welcome you to, to this side event to discuss the impact of the work of the independent expert on protection against bio violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity during the period 2017-2022. Chile, together with other members of the core group of the SOGI resolution, including Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Uruguay, have considered that it's it, 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 this is a good opportunity to hold this meeting. For the organization, we have the support and, 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 and we have a very strong support actually uh, from the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans and Intersex Association, ILGA, and the International Service for Human Rights, whom I, I really wish to thank because they have been wonderful with us in organizing this event. Thank you so much. As you know, the aim of this meeting is basically to generate an instance for dialogue between different stakeholders uh, on the work um, that the SOGI Minded has been uh, carrying out for several years and to evaluate the impacts and the challenges for the future of this mandate. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here this afternoon and we have so much to talk. But before uh, and to start this event, we are really uh, honored to have a, a, a short video and with a, with a message from the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. Let's listen to that. Dear colleagues, first, I want to thank the Permanent Mission of Chile for inviting me to this important discussion. I'm so sorry I cannot be there in person, but I want it to be, so that's why I'm sending this video. Much has been achieved in the promotion and protection of the human rights of LGBTI people. Although landmark progress has been made over the years in different regions around the world, many LGBTI people continue to face discrimination and violence. As of today, only one out of three countries in the world prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. One out of 10 countries prohibit discrimination based on gender identity and 2% of countries prohibit discrimination against intersex people. Discriminatory laws violate fundamental rights and reinforce stigmas, rendering already discriminated groups even more stigmatized. Discriminatory laws contribute to the rise in hate speech, trigger violence against LGBTI persons, and deepen socioeconomic exclusion. Time and again, we have witnessed LGBTI persons become victims of hate crimes, and even persecuted by states within the framework of laws that unfairly discriminate against them, which often leads to their arbitrary arrest and prosecution. Discriminatory laws have no place in an equal and inclusive society and must be repealed accordingly. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated exclusion and acts of violence against LGBTI people. We have witnessed a rise in reports of domestic abuse and increased hate speech against LGBTI people, in particular of trans people, both offline and online. Reports indicate that some countries have taken measures to restrict the rights of trans people. In the past decade, my office has been actively engaged in addressing the challenges and needs of LGBTI people in close engagement with member states and civil society actors. I commend the increasing focus on the promotion of the rights for LGBTI people at the level of member states and the Human Rights Council. The creation of the mandate of independent expert on SOGI represented a major milestone in our collective endeavor for equality. I would like to recognize the significant contributions the mandate has made in addressing the human rights violations and abuses committed against LGBTI people and ensuring the full enjoyment of their human rights. My office is committed to supporting the mandate of the UN Independent Expert on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. My office has been working towards equality for LGBTI people through a wide array of activities and advocacy efforts. 
Through our presence in 92 countries, we provide support to national actors in strengthening their national systems for the protection of human rights. This includes advocating for improved human rights legislations on their rights and for the decriminalization of consensual same-sex relations and transgender persons. We'll continue to speak out when we witness human rights violations against LGBTI people. We'll continue to take a strong stand against threats, attacks, arrest, harassment, and discriminatory restrictions against all human beings, including LGBTI persons. We will also continue to work towards equality and advance our free and equal public information campaign, which is one of the most successful campaigns of the United Nations. In addition to a global campaign, Several national campaigns are taking place in dozens of countries. The ultimate objective of this campaign is to raise awareness on the human rights of LGBTI people, debunk harmful myths and stereotypes, and increase uh, public support for equality and non-discrimination. We will continue to collaborate closely with our UN partners to strengthen the UN's response to violence and discrimination against LGBTI people, and to translate into action the Secretary General's call to action for human rights and our common agenda, which includes a strong commitment for the UN system to consistently advance gender equality. We are pleased to know that the universal periodic review process has resulted in more than 140 states from all regions accepting at least one recommendation to address violence or discrimination against LGBTI people. Last but not least, we continue to advocate for improved business respect for human rights for LGBTI people in the workplace and beyond through the implementation of the standards of conduct for business, which we launched in 2017 and which has received the support of more than 350 companies to date. I look forward to continuing our important discussions on ways of supporting work on sexual orientation and gender identity. I thank you for your attention. So let me thank um, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, for her work, for her words uh, in this short video, and also um, the review, a little review, small, short review of the relevance of the independent expert mandate. As all of you here uh, this afternoon are aware, the High Commissioner has constantly been calling for concrete actions to protect LGBTQ people and to ensure the principle of equality that is enshrined in at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So next, it is actually um, a pleasure to give the floor to the President of the Human Rights Council and also a dear colleague, Ambassador Francisco Villegas. Buenas uh, tardes. Good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Yes? Very well. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's a an honor and a pleasure as president of the Human Rights Council to be here with you. And um, I would like to just briefly share with you why as president of the Human Rights Council, I think it's so important to, to this mandate and the continuation of this mandate for the Human Rights Council. First of all, a historical perspective uh, always needs to be put into place. And as we all know, for 300 years, uh, international law didn't care about the people, only cared about the interests of the states. This revolutionary idea that one person has a right beyond being a national of a state or another, and that the whole world has to pro collectively protect those rights of that person, is a revolutionary idea that changed the whole idea of international law, but it only has 77 years old. So in historical perspective, what we are doing, what we are discussing today, it, it is the tip of the iceberg of what's to come in human rights. And what you just said, Claudia uh, and Bachelet and everything, uh, Madame Bachelet on, on the wide diversity of national laws regarding uh, sexual orientation, uh, criminalization uh, on same-sex uh, relations, etc. That shows you how far we have to go. But why is important here in the council? And um, first of all, I would like to just briefly go back to something that we don't do often in the council, which is to 
read again the resolutions that we negotiate. Sometimes we approve resolutions, many, many, many. Actually, we are starting the 50th session of the council yesterday, I inaugurated, and uh, we had two, over 2,000 resolutions in the 50 sessions. But so these few comments will just go to the basics, which is to read three or four preambular paragraphs of the resolution that created this mandate in 2016. And how can we link that to today's situation and why we need to uh, renew this mandate? If we go to the preambular paragraph of resolution 32, uh, slash two of 2016, and we go to the fifth. It says, stressing the need to maintain joint ownership of the international human rights agenda and to consider human rights issues in an objective and non-confrontational manner. That's, that is exactly what we have to remember every time we sit at the Human Rights Council. We are 47 countries representing 193 countries. So literally, we are representing 7 billion people, the rights of 7 billion people. But it's a collective effort to make this work. So we have to live up to that message that we put there in that resolution. And we have to be honest, several of uh, members of the Human Rights Council today still uh, criminalize same-sex relations. So just if you look at the perspective of what does it mean that you are a member of the council, what we are saying is that every single mandate, it doesn't matter if it was approved by consensus or by a vote. It's very legitimate and we will have very strong discussions as you know, as you can imagine. And I always say it's legitimate to have huge discussions, very hard discussions during the negotiation of a resolution. But once a resolution is approved according to the rules of procedure, that resolution is valid. And the, the one approved by consensus and the one approved by vote have the same value and we all have to uh, support it. So that that is something that we have to insist when we negotiate, to go back to that phrase. The other one I want you to recall is the one that says further down, reiterating the importance of respecting regional, cultural, and religious value systems, as well as particularities in considering human rights issues. And of course, we have to accept this is a process, it's a working process, and different regions and countries have different time some pace to evolve. And uh, as long as we are all clear that we have to evolve, we will be fine. And I, I have to remind you that in the regional preparatory com uh, conference of Durban, the Americas was able to put in the outcome document, preparing to Durban sexual orientation. And, uh, but unfortunately, of course, that those, that, uh, was erased from the final document in Durban. So we do have the uh, regional developments we have to share. The other one is underlining the fundamental importance of respecting relevant domestic debates at the national level on matters associated with historical, cultural, social, and religious sensitivity. Of course, these things, these changes doesn't happen overnight. And the same way that this mandate didn't come to light overnight. When I was came the first time in Gen to Geneva in 2003, the two words sexual orientation were not allowed in any resolution. And we had to fight for those two words in only one resolution. There was the mandate of the rapporteur on extrajudicial executions. And uh, we were the ones insisting that in the mandate, the, the the persons that were executed because of their sexual orientation had to be taken into account. It was a huge fight. We had to go to a vote. And now look, we have an independent mechanism on that. So, and it took some years. So in each country, it will happen. Argentina, and I'm so proud to have Alba Rueda here, 
nuestra embajadora. Uh, so, so proud that my country uh, that used to be so conservative in these issues, like many other countries, is able to be one of the leading countries in the world on, 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 on our legislation. And so it's a, it's a, it's, I'm very proud that I'm sharing this with Alba. So, and, and last, with this I conclude, uh, two more. One says, deploring the use of external pressure and coercive measures against states, particularly developing countries, including through the use and threat of use of economic sanctions or application of conditionality to official development assistance. This is a very important thing. We cannot accept that some countries use cooperation as an, a, a, an extortion to uh, other countries uh, adopt certain policies. Because we never did that with them. Uh, uh, Argentina had uh, uh, you know, equal marriage and same-sex marriage way before many European countries. And we never went to a bilateral meeting with the UK or France or the US saying, you should do this, you should do that. Uh, because each society is the one that has to evolve and we have to respect the pace and, and the debates and just help from the South, others, countries from the south to have those debates. And we might have uh, Alba Rueda uh, uh, sharing the experience of Argentina in a country where they are debating these issues. And that is much more meaningful than having a developed country that spends millions of dollars in another country saying that you, if you adopt this policy, you will continue having our money. And with this, I conclude the last one underlining the President's resolution this mandate should be implemented while ensuring respect for the sovereign right of each country, as well as its national laws, development priorities, the various religious and ethical barriers and cultural backgrounds. And this is my last message. It is wrong to think that sexual orientation and the respect for people and gender identity and, and people's choices is a human rights issue only. It's not a human rights issue only, it's a development issue. Because when uh, societies mm. uh, are more inclusive and they realize that diversity makes a society richer and discrimination makes a society poorer. So it is a factor of development uh, and it will be a development of the whole universal system to extend this mandate. As president of the council, you will have the, my support that this council continues to move forward in this agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador uh, Villegas, for your words um, and a great overview also of the uh, understanding um, SOGI rights within the council. So now I actually have to give the floor to myself, which is kind of a strange, <laughs> but I will, cut, I will try to keep it in the three minutes that I have to speak. So let me start by saying that um, this is uh, personally a topic that is very uh, dear to me and close to my heart. So that means that it will be also become an important uh, subject for our mission here in Geneva. But most importantly, I think this is also uh, and, and, and I'm sure some of you know, this, this is an important topic for my government. So President uh, Boric, when he assumed in March this year, in his uh, first statement, in his first speech towards the nation, actually he was very clear in saying that LGBTQ uh, plus rights was going to become an important part of Chile's agenda because he believes, and also the members of, of, of his cabinet, believe and are actually working on that, that is important to um, actually work towards uh, the elimination of violence and discrimination against LGBTQ. And uh, I'm confident that my government will actually take important steps in order to do that. So this is uh, to start. And second, let me, uh, let me say that I also share the fact that I'm uh, very proud as Ambassador Federico Villegas to say, 
that um, uh, the mandate of, of, uh, of, uh, of related to SOGI is something that it has been pursued by, by a group of Latin American states. I think this is a great achievement. It actually shows how much uh, Latin American states can do when we work and, and we are able to cooperate together. And in this case, um, this group of Latin American countries have taken actually uh, an, uh, the, the initiative and understood the value of generating this mandate. And I think this is uh, important to underscore. In particular, let me talk a little bit uh, about uh, uh, of Chile. Um, I, would, I would like to say that in, in the past 10 years, probably in the, in the last decades, we have seen important changes, reform, and also legal reforms in terms of uh, eliminating uh, violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. But as, as, as it happens in many issues related to human rights, we actually only start taking me real measures after, you know, there is some sort of tragedy um, or important human rights violations taking place. In the case of Chile, um, this relates to, um, to one case, which is actually a hate crime that happened in 2012, which was the murder of a 24-year-old man named Daniel Samudio, uh, who, and this murder was certainly motivated but because of his sexual orientation. So that um, what happened, or the murder of Dan Daniel Samudio, actually took went deeply into Chilean society, uh, making making this um, issue of discrimination very visible, um, and the issue of violence something that started to be more discussed within Chile. Uh, I would say that it was even somehow like a turning point that allow raising awareness and started a really important um, local and national debate on this subject in a more open way. Um, and actually after that important, le 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 we, we, we had important legislative changes because of that. In fact, um, the first of these uh, important changes and adoptions in terms of uh, legislative changes was a law that is in Chile called the Samudio Law, which establishes judicial mechanisms that make it possible to effectively restore the rule of law when an act of arbitrary discrimination is committed. Today, the right to another changes happen afterwards. Today, the right to gender identity is legally recognized and given legal protection in Chile. We have also legalized same-sex marriage. Uh, it took time, but finally, uh, very recently, we, we managed to legalize same-sex marriage. And a law has recently been adopted that protects children and uh, teenagers from being arbitrarily discriminated against, ba uh, discriminated against based on sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual characteristic as well. Um, so that is at the domestic level, but I think Chile also, as we have been discussing re recently, has been very active at the multilateral front. And let me give some uh, examples of that. In the Human Rights Council, Chile has not only co-sponsored the resolutions on this issue, SOGI, but has also played a leading role in the adoption of these resolutions, has signed all the joint statements on violence and discriminations based on sexual orientation and gender identity, and of course, as we said before, is currently part of the group of friends of the SOGI mandate. In the Universal Periodic Review, Chile has established the human rights of LGBTQ people uh, as a thematic priority, and Chile has normally is uh, providing important recommendations to other member states on these issues as well. In 2014, Chile became the first country in Latin America to be part of the Global Equality Fund. And in 2016, I found a member of the Equal um, Rights Coalition as well. So in this sense, uh, let me say that I'm really proud that we have been part of the creation and renewal of the mandate of the SOG independent expert, and that we have been fortunate to have Victor Madrigal whose professional work has managed to place on the United Nations agenda uh, this topic as it ha has never been placed at, at the UN before. Um, and having said that, uh, let me give the floor 
to Victor. And it's, once again, it's a real pleasure to have you, Victor, and to listen to you and to learn actually from your work. Thank you so much to be here this afternoon. Ambassador Fuentes, thank you for your very kind words. And thank you for, uh, of course, uh, taking the job to, to moderate this event, uh, which of course, uh, as you can imagine, it's a great source of pleasure and satisfaction to me because it reunites not only so many champions on, of human rights, but most importantly, uh, friends of the mandate. Um, I, I want to specifically thank uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, for her words, for her wisdom, for the way that she actually has explained to us uh, in a way, a very broad state of the world. And of course, recognize her vision and her leadership and her unwavering support to this issue. It's been a true honor uh, to work uh, with the High Commissioner uh, herself as she um, uh, continues uh, for a few months uh, in her task. I also would like to very warmly thank uh, the President of the Human Rights uh, Council, a true champion of human rights, a person who understands deeply how human rights come into the political arena. And he, of course, has shared that with us today with a wonderful understanding of how time actually um, is, is, is occupied by actions that eventually lead to outcomes that are meaningful to people. And this is what I would like to place as my third word in relation to this uh, introduction is, I, I, I would like to begin to talk a little bit about what I understand is the impact of this wonderful machine that you all built and that I've been given the honor to drive for a few years. Um, everybody knows who has heard me talk before, I am acutely aware that I'm just the custodian of a mandate that I consider to be a patrimony of humankind. And the reason for that is because I actually think that what you all built together was uh, a, a, an, in, a, 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 an institutional manifestation, a mandate, uh, a, an independent mechanism, that has the possibility of being a catalyst in relation to processes that are there and that are necessary and that just require, in some cases, a particular brand of energy, a particular brand of uh, expertise, a particular brand of rigor in the analysis of international human rights law. And with this, I think that I begin to address a little bit my understanding of the reasons why the mandate was created. I think I've always thought that the mandate in that idea of um, being a catalyst is meant to do two things in general, and of course with the specificities that Ambassador Villegas was already mentioning. The first one is, I believe that what the mandate is uh, here to do is to provide visibility to the way in which violence and discrimination occurs in the everyday life of lesbian and gay, bisexual, trans and gender diverse persons and, and all of those that may not, may not identify as such but are also affected by violence and by discrimination. And providing that visibility is actually, I think, one of the great opportunities of this mandate, because let's think a little bit about how this is done. This is done by gathering evidence. And by gathering evidence uh, that I have been very lucky to um, enjoy in the support of states and uh, civil society organizations. To all of those in this room today, what I can share with you it's that I've had engagement and interest with well, of well over 100 states in one way or another, be it bilateral conversations, be it, be it engagement through communication procedures, be it through comments to my annual reports or through country visits, be it in dialogues in uh, the interactive dialogue at the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. We're now at a point where dialogue has been triggered in a number of venues and of course, all of you know that civil society is counted by the thousands of organizations around the world that are actually working in this field. I also gather evidence from persons having histories of violence and discrimination who are so kind as to share with me, sometimes through harrowing pain, 
the stories that they believe will make a difference when they are conveyed to others. And I hope that you know how um, important it is for me that it is known that these stories are treated with great respect mm -hmm. and in the understanding that they are shared with a purpose. Now, all of those elements also crystallize in significant opportunities within the United Nations family. I am one of the luckiest mandates because I have benefited from great work together with my colleagues. Uh, we are currently running a campaign with the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, uh, highlighting the work of LGBT defenders. But in the past, I've worked throughout <clears throat> the system with a number of rapporteurs that I think at this stage, if we count all of the engagements, are probably well over 40, uh, if not more. And then, of course, throughout the United Nations systems, we just uh, completed a campaign with the Secretary General Special Envoy on Youth. And as you know, I maintain an ongoing alliance with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, one with United Nations Women, and UN Women, and of course, very strong relations across the board. All of this to tell you, I think that what you created when you created this mandate, and I keep on saying you because as those of you who are close to the process are aware, I, I had very little to do with that process. I, I was just fortunate enough to be the one designated to, to run the machine. But what you created was an entity, uh, a, a mechanism that has the possibility of having that overview and then creating some opportunities for that, for that catalyzing uh, experience. Um, we've been working together in placing uh, issues of sexual orientation and gender identity in the domestic, regional, and global agendas. We have been working together in ensuring that the convening power of this mandate to those that are deeply immersed and let's say, already very convinced of all of the theoretical and practical aspects, but also all of those who have doubts or diverging views. I'm very proud that I have never gone to a country in whatever kind of visits uh, without having reached out and in most cases received the interest to engage by all of the religious uh, re leaders uh, of all denominations that are uh, in that country. And that is because even when we disagree in certain aspects, I have the firm belief that we all agree in the need to ensure that violence and discrimination be eradicated. Um, and of course, um, then we can end up in places where we may not completely agree. But I have to tell you, my experience is that out of dialogue comes the understanding that we agree on a lot more than what we believed. I also wanted to mention that I see the mandate as a mandate that is not only a convener or a catalyst, but most importantly, providing advice. And in this, the presentations and information that has been given to my mandate about the good and best practice um, is very important. I always give uh, states, uh, NGOs, and other stakeholders the idea that um, I actually try to identify as many good practices so that we can actually um, make sure to share uh, those across the board. And usually I go by the rule of thumb that my reports tend to be, as you know, reports are scrupulously 10,700 10, words. My reports tend to be 5,000 words uh, constructive criticism and 5,000 words technical advice. And so I'm hoping that those balances are something that you see in the, um, in, in the work of the mandate, because it tends to be all across. Um, to, 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 to all of those in the panel, um, I wanted to, to also thank you for uh, your continued uh, commitment and support to the mandate. I am very, very honored to have the support of so many persons in doing the job that I do. To those that I've already thanked, I would like to, of course, add the Honorable Alejandra Costa, um, uh, of course, Ambassador Alba Rueda, and, of, and, and as well as 
Dr. Julia Ert, all of whom are uh, every day making significant contributions to uh, this work. And uh, to all of whom, of course, I'm indebted as well as the other speakers and Ambassador Fuentes, you as a moderator. I'd like my last word uh, on this call to be, uh, to kind of end where I started. This mandate is meaningful to people. Mm. I recently spoke to um, a young activist of a country in which hardship faced by LGBT persons is of a dimension that I think it's hard to grasp just by words. And um, I said to her, I'm, I'm so sorry that I was able to do so little uh, when I was visiting the country. And, she, and what she said to me was very precious. She said, um, we saw you uh, meeting with the minister of religion. Uh, we saw that picture. And when we saw that picture, we knew that avenues would be opening for us. And indeed they have opened for us on the basis of that. Um, the machine brings with it um, the convening and the power of open doors that United Nations brands. And I think that it's important to remember that this means to people that are experiencing hardship in their lives. I want to thank you very warmly. I will see you very soon, uh, I'm sure in different activities, but in the meantime, thank you for putting this together and to the substantial uh, attendance, thanks all of you for your interest as always. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you, Victor, for your words. We have been learning from you, of course, throughout your mandate, but also during your talk, talk today so much about your mandate and the importance of visibility to provide um, the preven prevention and protection of violence, the importance of gathering evidence that you have done so much through your re different reports throughout this time, and also the importance of good advice and uh, also um, uh, best practices in order to actually be able to move forward as well. But most importantly, and uh, uh, thank you for bringing back humanity to the table. I really liked the fact that you talk about how this is meaningful to people. And I think this is why we're all here, you know, to bring back a little bit of humanity and dignity of human beings. So thank you so much, Victor. I really, um, I, I really uh, enjoy your, your, your talk. Thank you. So let me continue with actually this mandate would it have been uh, possible without uh, civil society uh, and, and without the intense work of many uh, NGOs and members uh, of LGBT communities. So I'm really um, pleased to give the floor to Julia Echt, if I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it well, Julia, you, you let me know. Uh, she, uh, the Executive Director of the International Gay and Lesbian Association, ILGA. Thank you so much, Julia, for being uh, with us this afternoon. Um, thank you, Ambassador Fuentes, and pronunciation was um, brilliant of the last time. I know it's a hard one, it's a very hard German last name. Um, but yeah, thank you, Ambassador Fuentes, and thank you as well, um, Ambassador Villegas, President of the UN Rights Council. Thank you, Alba Rueda, LGBT envoy of Argentina, and as well, thank you, um, Commissioner Bachelet, for the video message today. Thank you for speaking here today and showing like the most high-level support for this mandate that we could envision. And thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to speak today to you. I do as well want to thank the LAC7 for co-sponsoring and co-organizing this event with us. And I suppose I as well should be thanking you for the creation of the mandate in the first place. <laughs> um, and I will say, before I go into the, um, the topic of, of today, I will as well say that um, the way how um, civil society, governments, and non-governmental actors are working together in a spirit of mutual collaboration, as well as having the, the ability to hold each other to account in both the creation as well as the renewal of this mandate, I think should work as showcases like a good practice model how this can be done. And I think it could be a very good model for other areas of our work where you know this is not going as smoothly as it could be or as it does here. However, let me come to um, what are the contributions of the mandate from a civil society perspective? And let me start saying this. I think the relevance of the mandate of the UN independent expert on SOGI for persons of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities cannot be overstated. 
So I say it again, this, the relevance of this mandate cannot be overstated from a civil society point of view. And actually I believe as well from any other vantage point. Because in particular, um, this mandate is as well a sign that the human rights agenda and the, U the UN human rights system as such is not static, but it's dynamic and it's responsive. And it shows that we all have the collective ability to develop and advance human rights framework. And I think this mandate as well stands for it because it is controversial, because it is, has been so hard in creating this mandate. And from that point of view, I think we cherish this mandate not only because of its substance, but because of its relevance for the human rights architecture on our planet. And yes, many have said that, civil society, as well as many, many other actors have worked incredibly hard in both the creation as well as in the renewal of this important special procedures mandate. Hundreds, if not thousands of activists across the world have supported the creation of this mandate and more than 1,300 organizations have called upon the HRC members three years ago to renew it. However, despite of all these efforts, we believe all this work that, that gone into it, we believe that the SOGI mandate has paid us back a hundredfold. So the creation of this mandate has been and continues to be a beacon of hope for the SOGI S communities across the world. It's the first time that we hear a special procedures mandate holder year around to address the issues our communities face, discrimination and violence and growth of SOGI. And of course, Civil society, as well as state actors and other institutions are addressing these issues too. However, what is different with the SOGI mandate is that it's a sign of recognition of the UN human rights system for the suffering of, the communi of our communities, for the, it's a sign of recognition for the appalling human rights violations LGBTI people face. And the SOGI mandate on top of that can address all these issues consistently and permanently and in the spirit of mutual dialogue and accountability in spaces that are close to SOGI organizations and civil society as such. The mandate holder can address these things as well sometimes in spaces where countries either wouldn't or don't address these things. So in that sense, Victor, our current mandate holder, is an ambassador for our rights, for SOGI rights as a whole. Further, other than you know, these more meta issues, the mandate has helped distill or define, or let's say bring out global agendas that are relative, uh, that are relevant for the communities that we serve and has given those issues both voice and weight and criminalization by 2030 and conversion therapy by 2030 legal gender recognition based on self-determination. These are three pillars that the, the current mandate has, holder has identified in collaboration with civil society and based on the evidence collected. And no one can ignore these three pillars. And it's as well these three pillars that the mandate helped enshrine as an integral part of a global human rights agenda that we all collectively now can co-advance. However, let me as well elevate one, one further one further issue that I think is important, which already was kind of coined in the creation of the mandate. And that is that sexual orientation and gender identity are conceptualized on equal footing in the mandate. And although on global level, it seems to be obvious today that this is how it should be. I don't think that was the case 10 years ago. When the mandate was when the mandate was you know started to be created on the but on the global level, it was has always been sexual orientation and gender identity, already at a time when gender identity very very often was pulling at the shorter end of the string, and I think the credit here goes to the Lac Seven as well as to the civil society and all people who have helped create and shape this this mandate in the beginning, and I think that cannot be underestimated as well. And I mean, when you look at the work of the mandate, this is not only visible in you know, standalone reports, such as the report on legal gender recognition, where many of the statements that the mandate holders have, have um, published that focus on discrimination, violence on gender diverse persons and trans persons alike. It's as well 
how both sexual orientation and gender identity is kind of streamlined and mainstream throughout the work of the mandate in country visits, in thematic reports, in statements where the mandate holder goes. So, and I think that is a huge credit as well to the person who fills, or to the two persons so far, who have filled these mandates with life. Because they could have, they could have as well approached it differently. And I think that credit really goes to them. And then finally, let me conclude with the following. As I've said, the mandate has not only worked hard in the defense, of rights of persons with diverse sexual orientations and gender identity. The mandate holders have not only tirelessly worked, pushed themselves to the limits of their own exhaustion and sometimes beyond in battling discrimination, violence, the communities that ILGA world as well serves face. The mandate has as well documented overwhelming evidence of the atrocities LGBT persons face globally. That they face sometimes from the hands of their own family members in public and in private spaces, in civic organizing, in violation of the freedom of opinion and expression, in the access to housing, the access to the labor market, and access to healthcare, and the list goes on and on. So the document has skillfully documented all of these violations to build one piece of evidence that no one on this planet can and shall ignore. And that is that the work of this man that is not over and it won't be over for decades and we cannot stop having the mandate now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Julia, for your intervention. We learned so much from you, especially in terms of how much the mandate uh, has given voice and weight, as you put it, to the LGBTQI uh, community. Um, thank you so much, Julia. I appreciate your words. Um, let me continue as uh, uh, the SOGI um, has became really relevant, so relevant that there are currently four countries in the world that have created the figure of a special representatives on sexual orientation and gender identity. And we actually have one of them here with us. So I'm pleased to give the floor to Alba, Ms. Alba Rueda. She is uh, actually the SOGI special representative of Argentina. Um, Alba, you have the floor. Bien, buen día a todos. ¿Qué tal? Muchísimas gracias por esta invitación a la misión permanente de Chile en Naciones Unidas, a todos quienes tomaron la palabra y por supuesto este, a quienes nos acompañan en la, en la mañana de hoy. Aquí este, voy a decir que desde este sur global eh, es de mañana, es muy temprano, eh, y estamos en invierno, así que también me van a ver más abrigada de lo que de lo que tendría que estar en un evento este, compartido. ¿no? Quiero recuperar de verdad el aporte fundamental de Naciones Unidas en el rol del experto independiente. Este es este, mi aporte para esta mañana. Eh, especialmente, por, su, por supuesto, el experto independiente en orientación sexual e identidad de género, porque nos permitió validar el cumplimiento de una agenda de derechos humanos y de la comunidad LGBT en nuestro país nos permitió validar este aporte. Y sabemos que justamente fue un espacio que se ha desarrollado a lo largo de los años. Hace 20 años atrás, las agendas vinculadas a las causas vinculadas a los LGBT eran causas extrajudiciales, las sentencias basadas en orientación sexual e identidad de género, las causas ilegales. Y realmente en la concertación multilateral no teníamos espacios para poder dialogar sobre nuestros derechos la discriminación, la violencia y, por supuesto, también este, las mejores prácticas. El rol, el mandato del experto independiente fue fundamental para nuestro desarrollo en Argentina porque básicamente se focalizó en señalar violencia, discriminación, pero también estas mejores prácticas que permitió que tengamos vigilancia en el desarrollo de nuestras políticas públicas relacionadas a los derechos fundamentales como la identidad de género, la orientación sexual, pero también un abordaje sobre los derechos relacionados a la economía, la vida social LGBT, y ahí el aporte en contra de las violencias, en contra de la discriminación. Hoy en Argentina pudimos dar un paso fundamental. Contamos con el rol de la representación especial en orientación sexual e identidad de género para asumir en política exterior la responsabilidad de dialogar, pero también para plantear 
que las representaciones especiales no son privilegios de los países ricos. Es el derecho de nuestras comunidades para vivir en un mundo sin desigualdades. Y para este aporte, realmente el encuadre del sur global sobre las representaciones están ligadas, sobre las representaciones especiales, están ligadas al marco normativo, a las políticas públicas, pero también un abordaje, una posición social sobre quiénes son los sujetos de derecho en nuestras comunidades, en nuestras sociedades. Y digo esto porque es el momento de hablar de la igualdad sustantiva en la transversalidad necesaria que representa trabajar la no discriminación, las violencias y las intersecciones fundamentales para este trabajo, para esta lucha en el mundo. Es, es decir, hay que trabajar sobre el racismo, el clasismo, la desigualdad de, 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 económica y, por supuesto, el sexismo. Sin tener las posibilidades y conocer las experiencias que acercan los informes del experto independiente, estas estrategias no podríamos haber tenido la misma congruencia que tenemos hoy y el mismo diálogo que tenemos en el mundo. Realmente la guía para este desarrollo eh, por parte del experto independiente ha sido fundamental. Y en esa línea queremos traer y aportar que en Argentina tenemos evidencia, no solamente tenemos un cúmulo de derechos reconocidos, como por supuesto que se debaten como matrimonio igualitario, ley de identidad, una ley sobre cuota laboral para personas trans, este, para romper esa desigualdad estructural que se basa en una, en una desigualdad económica, sino también tenemos desarrollo de políticas públicas. Y ese desarrollo a lo largo de tantos años, más de 12 años de trabajo este, en políticas públicas, en marco normativo fuerte en torno a la diversidad sexual, nos ha generado la evidencia justamente que hay que continuar trabajando creando, debatiendo, construyendo este diálogo en Argentina y en el mundo. Cuando empezó todo esto en Argentina, la presidenta de aquel momento, cuando efectivamente se desarrolló, decía, cuando se reconocen derechos, toda la sociedad avanza. Y yo creo que este es el punto para poder señalar el enorme aporte de nuestras sociedades en el mundo y en la concertación. Debemos seguir trabajando en, este, en, en espacios también multilaterales porque no hay un desarrollo temático en Naciones Unidas sobre nuestros derechos LGBT. Y en este sentido, el, la renovación del mandato del experto independiente en orientación sexual e identidad de género es fundamental, porque justamente este es uno de los temas que está en debate, pero es necesario seguir investigando, seguir debatiendo. No se puede, si no se renueva el mandato, es callar la discusión. Y renovar el mandato por el otro lado es estar a favor de que el debate continúe en espacios multilaterales. Y sobre todo teniendo en cuenta el alcance del mandato en torno a los derechos más fundamentales. No solo de las personas LGBTIQ+, sino también de la perspectiva de derechos humanos en nuestro mundo. Así que este es el aporte, esta es la reacción que queríamos tener para poder este, hablar acerca de la fundamental actuación que tiene que tener Naciones Unidas al trabajar en una mesa de diálogo en torno a la diversidad sexual, en torno a los derechos LGBT, en torno a la orientación sexual e identidad de género. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Alba. Eh, y, y siempre agradeciendo el gran liderazgo de Argentina en esta materia. Eh, siempre me ha impresionado mucho y lo, lo, lo admiro mucho. Um, let me continue now. Um, we, we, we have basically um, listened to different stakeholders, so now we actually have some time for dialogue, questions, comments. Around uh, 15 minutes is my understanding, if I'm correct. Uh, so I open the floor to that. So we already have um, two uh, Persons that already have, let me see who. Okay, so we have the DPR of Mexico, Senor Fernando Espinosa, that asked for the um, to intervene. Fernando, sí. if you're there. Hola, buenas tardes, embajadora. ¿Me puede escuchar? Perfectamente. Eh, gracias. Primeramente, una felicitación por la conducción de este evento. A usted, señora embajadora a los otros distinguidos embajadores que nos acompañan y a los panelistas. Uh, me cambiaré a inglés. Uh, yes, indeed, we believe that the mandate has contributed 
through dialogue and exchange of, of good practices to the full respect of human rights of all people. Um, however, we believe that a lot of work remains to be done to eradicate violence and discrimination based on Sochi. As uh, Victor Corrent correctly pointed out, the mandate has to be meaningful to people. I think he couldn't have phrased it on better words. As this is a Latin American uh, initiative, Mexico and the other members of the LAC7 have a responsibility actually to lead by example on this important topic, both nationally and internationally. For instance, I would like to point out that during the recent sessions of the WHA, we um, took the initiative actually to engage on a very constructive process to avoid the possibility of discrimination on health access based on SOGI. This is, I think, something that we are aiming actually to be vigilant, to keep alert in all international organizations. In Mexico, discrimination on any grounds is prohibited by the constitution, including on the basis of SOGI in accordance to our Supreme Tribunal. Uh, the other day, I had the chance to talk to Julia and we were basically commenting how difficult it is for conservative countries to have something like a change. It needs to, we need to face something like a cultural transformation, but also to undertake legal steps. And we're very proud actually that in the case of Mexico, the, um, legally we don't have discrimination on these grounds. Naturally, no country is free from challenges on this area. And in some cases, different sensitivities exist. So we fully support the mandate. We are convinced that it will continue to contribute positively and respectfully to the understanding and awareness of the situations of violence and discrimination that many people around the world face. Thank you very much to all and congratulations for this event. Gracias, muchas gracias. Thank you, Fernando, for joining us this afternoon and also for the support uh, for the mandate from Mexico. Thank you so much. So now we, uh, I would like to give the floor to the ambassador, uh, to the United, uh, U.S. ambassador, um, Madame Michelle Taylor. Thank you so much for putting on this event and, and for allowing all of us to participate. Um, I want to start just by emphasizing the continued strong U.S. support for not only the SOGI mandate, but for just bringing broader attention to SOGI issues to the UN and other multilateral spaces, as well as in our bilateral relationships. That's something that I'm personally very committed to and that the US is committed to as well. Um, I would just love to know um, from the independent expert, um, what your thoughts are about the renewal this year and what some of, some of the challenges might be and where we should be putting our energy just to make sure that we get strong support. Um, and also your thoughts on other resolutions and spaces where we should be looking to include explicit SOGI references. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And we also appreciate the support from the United States to the SOGI mandate. Thank you so much. Maybe I can give them, do, do we have any other uh, questions or comments before I can give the floor to Victor to answer that question? It seems that not at this point, right? Ambassador, yes. thank you so much. And I, I believe that there may have been a, a couple of other questions which I would be happy to refer to um, right now. They have been placed in the in the chat and I was looking at those, if that is agreeable to you, I'll just address that, them. That sounds wonderful because you know, the thing of looking at everything at the same time is confusing. So I know exactly how you, I know exactly how you feel ambassador. It's uh, many things in the air. Uh, thank you so much. And of course, to the distinguished uh, representatives of the United States and, uh, and uh, Mexico, thank you so much for your words as well. Um, I believe that there are three points that I could actually make reference to. The first one, and, and I just wanted to, to mention to you that I'm very lucky in many ways. And the other way that I'm very lucky is that you have given me the coolest acronym to meet with, because every time I go and I say, oh, I'm going to go and meet with the LAC7, people think of me as an international man of mystery. Right, it looks like, uh, so I think it's the coolest acronym and I think you should always keep it, the LAC7, that's actually really great. But having said that, 
let me try and be a little bit serious. Uh, I think in all of the interventions, what I wanted to uh, suggest to you as an understanding is that what the Human Rights Council does when it creates mandates is not saying that the world can be defined by that identity or that problem alone. What I think it's saying and what I think it said in the case of the Soji mandate is it was a pro political statement that if one is serious to work against violence and discrimination, sexual orientation and gender identity need to be part of that analysis. That is to me what that political acknowledgement means. Any analysis of violence and discrimination, any development agenda, any peace and armed conflict agenda would be incomplete if there's not an angle of it that actually looks at the point of entry of sexual orientation and gender identity, which lie at the base of so much violence and discrimination around the world. And so to me, this is why I would imagine that the only way to consider that the mandate's contribution um, would not have relevance is, well, either in the situation where that is no longer a problem, or secondly, in the situation where there is a suspicion that nothing else needs to be made visible. And let me reassure you, in both cases, the task is in the decades in front of us, as Dr. Ert said before me. Um, I have made three calls, as you know, and this will be the only three that I will make. I promise that I will make three global calls during my time. The first one was for a world free of criminalization by 2030. Uh, as of today, two billion people live in criminalized environments. That means that close to one out of three persons in the world is born in an environment where it is illegal to be gay or lesbian or trans. One out of three persons in this planet. That's a, that's, that's a task. The second one is for a world free of practices of conversion or so-called erroneously conversion therapy. Where, as you know, it's pervasive in so many places in the world. And unfortunately, as I'm on the record saying, there are countries in which uh, I know that legislative intention is to, to promote conversion therapies and to promote practices of conversion, as is the case that I'm on the record on in my engagement with Ghana, for example, where the legislation promotes uh, that type of practices or intends to promote. And uh, thirdly, uh, I made a call for a world of um, legal recognition of gender identity based on uh, self-identification. I need not tell um, those uh, of you who have been working on this for many decades. Um, in a world where uh, LGBT doesn't really describe a homogeneous, monolithic group of people, where that the differences exist within that people, the ones that begin uh, every, every moment of their life, every day of their life with enormous uh, disadvantage and enormous challenges in every act of their lives are uh, trans persons and of course, undoubtedly trans persons of color. Um, and I think that it's really important to acknowledge uh, those aspects and to uh, work on those campaigns. Those should take us to 2030 if it's so that we are able to achieve um, those three elements, I think as a part of the agenda would be solved. Uh, others would remain probably for decades to come because let us remember pathologization, criminalization and demonization have carved deep grooves in the social awareness of our countries. And that means that there is still, even if the law is not there, there is the impression that uh, communities, populations, and peoples are antisocial, that their nature is immoral, and so on and so forth. Um, those are my thoughts in relation to the renewal. I, I, I would warmly advise it, <laughs> that to say, um, because I actually think uh, that's the case. As you know, I, I keep the mandate away from political negotiations, but I do believe that it's important that the message cuts across. The task is nowhere near to be done. And finally, to the colleagues on the chat uh, who raised some questions, 
um, uh, crime prevention and criminal justice are targets uh, of the mandate, and I'm very interested in the next wave of thematic research to be able to work on that. So UNODC that you mentioned is one of the targets, of course, of interest of the mandate. Um, uh, Melanie Nathan, hello, Melanie, uh, asked about uh, legislation uh, coming into force in the United Kingdom concerning uh, refugees and asylum seekers. And I just wanted to say, all of this type of subject matter is part of a continuous engagement of the mandate. Uh, to me, it's important that in case that uh, there's any uh, particular interest, uh, the mandate is always open uh, to dialogue and of course, through the different mechanisms available. Uh, but please be aware, this is, this is something that not only in my alliance with the UNHCR, where I'm very, very uh, keen on studying these issues. It also makes part of a significant bilateral agenda for a conversation with many countries uh, around the world. Um, and then in relation to activism in Africa and the change that um, the work on the mandate on criminalization can bring, I just wanted to mention, I, I, I have had the honor of visiting Mozambique. I've been the, I have had the honor of visiting <clears throat> countries uh, such as Botswana and South Africa in promotional visits. I've worked extensively in uh, other countries in the region, Niger, Tanzania, uh, Gambia, Togo, Benin. All of those countries uh, are, uh, I think, significant opportunities for dialogue because let us not forget that the uh, criminalization of same-sex intimacy made its, made its way in the books as a result of legislation which cannot be claimed to have been part of the vernacular. Uh, it's legislation that was uh, imposed through uh, processes of colonization. And to me, the question is to what extent is this an argument, an, uh, argument uh, uh, an area to be studied? And as you know, this is why I'm very looking forward to our dialogues in relation to my report on criminalization, uh, sorry, on colonialism which will be my last report to the General Assembly of the organization in October of 2023. Uh, so to the colleagues um, that uh, raised those questions, thank you. And of course, you know that the mandate is always very easy to reach, uh, hopefully uh, we keep that guarantee. So by whatever means, please make sure that you let us know if there's any other question. Uh, and Ambassador Fuentes, I, I hand it back to you and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to refer to these points. No, no, no. Thank you so much, Victor. You were wonderful. You answered all the three questions here in the chat that I finally found um, quite in a precise way. And thank you so much. I have to give now the floor to the Minister, Counselor or, and DPR of the Permanent Mission of Uruguay. Um, it is an honor to have you, Alejandra, here this afternoon. And so you can offer also some of uh, insights on these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I've been, uh, it's one of the few times when I've actually been listening to whatever is said in a Zoom, right? Because we all get distracted during Zooms, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been amazing. So Ambassador, and first of all, uh, if you let me, I would like to express my gratitude to Montserrat, your, uh, your, your uh, a colleague at the mission, which has been very helpful and has worked really hard, I know, on this, uh, uh, event. Um, so to Montserrat, thank you. And of course, I do want to thank the excellent panelists and colleagues for this uh, relevant exercise that uh, doesn't name to listen to ourselves, but but especially it looks forward, it looks for um, get an assessment on the impact and challenges face it by the mandate on, on, well, on the protection against violence and discrimination based on uh, sexual orientation and uh, gender identity, which as Victor said uh, in different words, it belongs to the international community. So you know that uh, my country Uruguay has been of course a proud supporter uh, of the Sochi mandate and our conviction grows stronger whenever we talk with civil society. Big, and small organizations uh, to which the pure existence of the mandate um, is a recognition of their right to exist and to live a life free of violence, violence and discriminations as 
every and each human being. So picking from um, this, bear with me, it's gonna be a little bit um, messy, but um, picking from what uh, the High Commissioner and Ambassador Willy Pichega said, um, it just amazed me each time I hear the numbers of how many countries are still criminalizing um, same-sex relations. And let's start from there. No, no, don't, we, we don't even need to get you know, to more uh, uh, specific, just that. But as Ambassador Rivera said, we have to evolve. And I think that, of course, uh, he said that, uh, and it's true, as the resolution said, we have to take into account the different national, regional particularities uh, in every country in terms of our cultural, our social, our historical baggage, but it is the duty to states, of states, I should say, to promote and protect all human rights and fundamental freedoms of our societies. So he said, we have to evolve. And uh, I think I, I completely agree. And I'm gonna add something else we have to evolve, we as societies have to evolve. It's not only the countries that are in the council or people that are here in Geneva, we all understand of course each other, but we need to make our countries, our societies evolve. Mm -hmm. And that is that takes much more work, you know, than the adoption of resolutions on the countries, on the, um, on the council. Implementing the resolutions is the key uh, work that uh, we need to focus on. Uh, that means taking measures to enrich and broad our society's comprehension on why discrimination of any kind, of course, of any kind, but in this case, especially on soggy um, grounds, has to be prevented and fought. And there's no lighter word to say it. We need to fight discrimination. And here's where the work of the independent expert, and, uh, and I have to say, I'm sorry, Victor, I know you don't like to be pat on the back, but uh, <laughs> your work especially, you have been and uh, have proven to be extremely helpful. You have worked with stakeholders that matter and that actually are influential on, on each one of us as human beings, I mean, on our societies. In that, um, and that is extremely important. Ambassador Fuentes was um, talking about the case, uh, the Samudio case, which I remember perfectly. Sometimes, yes, it is true. And even now, uh, even in our countries, which uh, we were very pioneer with uh, all these uh, issues, it's still uh, sadly something like this is what takes to make a difference and to make our uh, governments realize that we have to change laws and we have to take a bit extreme measures to make sure that uh, we do treat everyone equally. So, um, and again, I got lost, but uh, uh, the thing is that, uh, You said also, Victor, that I got, I, I, I got lost. Uh, no, you, again, going really back to the roots of it, the, the fundamental freedoms and, uh, and, and human rights should not and cannot be denied to any individual. Um, the obligations stemming from the international law are crystal clear on this matter. And of course, um, the, the uh, independent expert reports the, the, the last years, last year, yeah, and reports that were presented to the Human Rights Council and to the General Assembly state that very um, accessible, in a, in a very clear and accessible way. So the mandate is controversial. Jula say that, and it is true, and it's a good thing. Again, it's related on how different our societies are and how we need to take that into account. So I'm not gonna, I, I think, yes, I think I should be wrapping up now, not that it was very orderly, but, uh, but again, we need, um, yes, as also Ambassador Weda said, uh, we need to 
keep working on our work without differences, without um, without any kind of discrimination. And it that uh, she said, um, you said, Ambassador, uh, something like, uh, um, el camino está, el camino está, comenzó de cierta forma. So the way it is true has been bad. And, uh, and of course, as Victor said, there's a lot of things to be done, but I'm gonna just, you know what, um, I was remembering one very um, politically incorrect nowadays ad, cigarette ad that was a long time ago, uh, ago, and please don't quote me, but it said, you come a long way, baby. And I think regarding soji matters, we've come a long way. We should be proud, we should keep on working, and it should be um, something to, um, you know, inflate our um, souls to keep working and not to let our societies uh, take any step back. So thank you very much again, Ambassador. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, everyone. And I'm sorry, again, I always keep telling you, I'm very, uh, I'm not very, uh, a very other person. So I, excuse, I'm sorry, but uh, well, this is just what comes out whenever I <laughs> I, uh, I have to wrap up anything. Thank you very much. Gracias, Alejandra. Thank you so much for you. I actually thought it was quite organized intervention. I like it. I, I love it. Thank you so much. And the support of Uruguay as well. So we have, I think, uh, uh, just uh, not a lot of time, maybe the last uh, three minutes uh, to 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 hear once again from Victor, if he wants to uh, say like uh, some final um, reflections maybe to, to uh, what he wants. There are also two additional questions, one about climate change and the second one related to uh, how can the international community actually support your work. So maybe take those questions or just whatever uh, uh, whatever you, you think is important to finish. Uh, Victor, thanks. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And um, just allow me a few moments to, um, well, first of all, provide an element of information, which is certainly climate change is part of the uh, elements, uh, areas of uh, concern of the mandate. I'm very interested to hear what communities and populations have to say about disproportionate impact of climate change in uh, communities and populations. I know this is a priority uh, area for our siblings in the Pacific Islands, particularly, and in general in small island states all throughout the globe. Um, I had the honor and pleasure to meet my colleague, the Ian Fry, the special rapporteur on climate change uh, in a mandate that you also created very recently. I, I must say by unanimity that mandate was created. So uh, very happy about that. Uh, and I wonder how it feels like. Uh, <laughs> I wonder how that feels like. But anyhow, um, maybe, maybe it's going to happen. Never know. Um, so uh, he and I will be doing something together. I think I can say that with uh, a lot of certainty, we will be doing something together. And of course, I think what we can do to help each other is to ensure that we keep the channels, channels of communication open. I steer the mandate because you tell me where to steer it. And when I say you, it's the, the, the imperial you, it's the people that the mandate is working with, states, non-states, academia, stakeholders. Um, when I did my work plan, I had the uh, pleasure of speaking to many of you through a number of town halls where hundreds of organizations and states participated, certainly the states uh, represented here today. And this is what the work plan was, how the work plan came about. This was a result of that. So this will happen again, um, certainly. My last word, uh, Ambassador, uh, uh, honorable persons, uh, colleagues in the, in the, in the room. Um, as you know, I don't involve myself in the politics of renewal of the mandate, but in case that the mandate is renewed, I'll be very happy to continue doing it for the next 18 months. I can assure you that you have my commitment, you have my energy, you have my conviction that this work needs to happen. And then, if that is the case, then there will be a process of selection of a new mandate holder, which I trust and, and hope will be done uh, also embracing the diversity um, hopefully somebody ha that has uh, fresh eyes, different eyes, different uh, ways. So my last message, in case that the mandate is renewed, 
please know you have me 100% committed to the task until the end of 2023. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Victor. And let me thank, uh, thank, uh, let me thank everyone uh, here. We had more than 100 participants at a certain point, so I think that's wonderful news. Thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you, Alba. Thank you, Alejandra, also to, um, to the ambassador of Argentina, Federico Villegas, as well and to all of you. And once again, uh, Victor, uh, it was a pleasure to have you. And um, we respect so much your commitment towards this, your, um, yes, just your spirit and your humanity. Thank you so much. And we are looking forward to the renewal of the mandate uh, shortly. So thank again, and uh, we will see you all very shortly.